Okay, in this video we'll take a look at enzyme inhibition. Enzymes can be inhibited either by outside factors which would actually make them poisons or by internal regulatory homeostatic mechanisms which keep the enzyme activity at just the appropriate level for whatever the needs of the cell happen to be at that time. There are two types of inhibition, competitive inhibition and non-competitive inhibition. In competitive inhibition, a molecule with the same shape as the substrate can compete for space at the active site. So if the enzyme here is designed to take this molecule in, and this is the substrate, it normally will produce some sort of a product. But if you introduce an inhibitor that has the same shape as the active site of the enzyme, it'll actually take up that space and as a result the substrate is kind of locked out and it can't fit in there. So it actually won't be reacting, it won't, the reaction won't be catalyzed. This will slow down the reaction rate. Very little product will be formed and if the inhibitor does not leave, the enzyme is basically ineffective. This kind of inhibition can be reversible or irreversible. Non-competitive inhibition or allosteric inhibition uh, is when the inhibitor binds to another place on the enzyme, not the active site, and it causes the enzyme to change its shape at the active site so that the substrate cannot bind. So you can see that normally the substrate would fit into this active site and then the reaction could be catalyzed. That requires an allosteric activator. However, if an inhibitor fits into the allosteric site. The substrate is locked out of the active site because the active site is now the wrong conformation for that substance. This results in the reaction rate being very, very low. This may also be reversible or irreversible. Let's take a look at an example of a reversible allosteric inhibition. Tryptophan is an amino acid that's synthesized by bacteria. It is used to build a protein that is in demand. And as you can see, it's built through a series of reactions and each one is catalyzed by a different enzyme. So we start with some sort of a reactant, a precursor to tryptophan, and it gets converted from one molecule to another type by an enzyme. Another reaction converts it to yet another substance and so on. So this is a metabolic pathway and the end product is tryptophan. When the protein to be built with tryptophan is in demand, tryptophan never accumulates because it's used immediately. But when the demand for the protein drops off, tryptophan begins to accumulate and it actually becomes a part of a cell regulating mechanism. The accumulating tryptophan allosterically binds to enzyme number one and alters its shape so that the substrate A can no longer bind to it. So A won't be able to fit into that enzyme. The chain of reaction ceases and no more tryptophan can be formed. What happens when tryptophan is again in demand? Well, this tryptophan that's just kind of lingering about here and occupying this site on the enzyme, this allosteric site on the enzyme, will actually be used up to make the desired protein and even this one will be used to make the protein. As a result, the pathway will become active again. Why is this called a self-regulating mechanism? It's self-regulating because tryptophan concentrations actually control their own production. When tryptophan levels rise, they shut down their own production. When tryptophan levels drop, the pathway becomes active again because there's no tryptophan to allosterically bind with the first enzyme. This ensures that just the right quantity of tryptophan is produced and no tryptophan is overproduced. We have a lot of these self-regulating homeostatic mechanisms within our bodies and involved in our metabolism. There's very little waste. Here are some examples of inhibition. There's end product inhibition. Most enzymatic reactions are part of a series of reactions, each catalyzed by its own enzyme and branching at some point. The intermediate or final product of one series of reactions may be a reversible inhibitor of another enzyme. So for example, if we start with a precursor, a reactant A, and it goes through a series of reactions to produce product C. C can actually participate in two different pathways. It can go on and produce D 
or D prime. And the end product of one pathway would be G, molecule G, and the end product of the other pathway would be G prime. Now, G and G prime never accumulate because as they are produced, they are moved to another location and used perhaps to build another molecule. So as long as they're being whisked away, these pathways can continue. But sometimes it might be desirable to shut one pathway down because you no longer require that product because it's not being used. And you might actually require more of the other product. Suppose that G was constantly being used and so was constantly being whisked away, but there's no longer demand for G prime and it began to accumulate. Well, in the vicinity of these reactions, it would be in very high concentration. And if it bound allosterically to enzyme 3 prime, it would actually act as an inhibitor and prevent this pathway from taking place. That would, in effect, reduce the amount of G prime being produced and it would actually favor this pathway and perhaps you would get more of product G being produced more quickly. If G prime becomes in demand again then all of these little molecules of G prime would be used up including the one that's inhibiting enzyme 3 and that pathway would open up again. So again this is an example of a self-regulating mechanism. Sometimes inhibitors act as medicines or poisons. An example of an inhibitor that acts as a medicine is penicillin. Penicillin acts as an inhibitor in bacteria and it actually prevents them from being able to do the reactions that help them to form cell walls and as a result the bacteria can't survive. This is what makes it such an effective medicine in our bodies. It's actually not inhibiting any reactions in our cells, but it is re inhibiting reactions in the bacterial cells. So this is how a lot of antibiotics work. An example of an inhibition that, is, that acts as a poison is hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide is a lethal, irreversible inhibitor of enzyme action in humans, and it's also the gas that's used in the gas chamber during capital punishment. Lead and other heavy metals are non-competitive inhibitors that cause poisoning when they bind irreversibly to enzymes and make them denature. Poisoning occurs, in this example, when turkey vultures and condors eat carcasses of animals shot with lead pellets. There are also inborn abnormalities of metabolism that involve enzymes. Inborn errors of metabolism result when an abnormal gene produces a defective enzyme so that one pathway cannot be followed. An example of an inborn error of amino acid metabolism is phenylketonuria or PKU which occurs once every 25,000 births worldwide but most frequently in Turkey where 1 in 2600 births results in PKU. Because of the enzyme that's not produced, certain amino acids accumulate and as a result they do damage to the nervous system and can cause cognitive delays and intellectual difficulties for children as they grow older and their nervous system is uh, developing. Uh, it's preventable but a special diet is required and so identification of birth by a blood sample is necessary if the child is going to grow up and develop a normally functioning nervous system. Cofactors are non-protein molecules that assist enzymes or move electrons, atoms or functional groups between reaction sites. A coenzyme is a non-protein group that helps out a reaction by donating or accepting electrons. Many are vitamins. For example, NAD is derived from niacin and FAD is derived from riboflavin. Inorganic factors such as ions are required to activate an enzyme. They include calcium, magnesium, manganese, copper and zinc. They complete the structure of an inactive enzyme and temporarily bond with an enzyme and substrate. So if you have two substrates that are going to fit into an active site, the sites may not fit perfectly well without one of these cofactors. And so the entire enzyme substrate cofactor complex might look something like this. And this would be the cofactor. It would be something like an ion that we would typically in everyday language call the mineral.
So we need both our vitamins and our minerals uh, to allow the enzymes to work properly. Okay, so that wraps up enzymes, and we've just talked about some abnormalities of enzyme function and how enzyme inhibition can actually act as a poison or how it can simply act to regulate the quantities of product being produced in a homeostatic manner.